sometimes when I start these videos and I say, hey, everybody, an AI whose name starts with G and ends with O-O-G-L-E uh, interprets that as me asking it for something and it interrupts the video making process and uh, starts transcribing my words, which is annoying. These things will get smarter, no question. Is this a video about AI? I don't know. Uh, I did a video a couple days ago about uh, cyberpunk, the genre, and whether or not we are moving into a cyberpunk future, or you know, if the present is a cyberpunk future. And um, I sat down to, to edit that video, and I just got just an exhaustion sort of swept over me. And not only did I not uh, complete the editing, I just I deleted the footage just so that I wouldn't feel guilty. But uh, in short, I'm, I've been talking with Claude and Bard daily about uh, cyberpunk works and the, the themes of cyberpunk and, you know, all in the service of a, a question. Are we in a cyberpunk future? And, you know, it's, it's a complicated answer. What is cyberpunk? Well, cyberpunk is typically uh, fiction, you know, science fiction that focuses on you know, the catchphrase is high-tech, low-life, which is to say a future in which there is great disparity between the wealthy and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, and our point-of-view characters tend to be the have-nots. Now, we'll catch glimpses of, you know, the lives of the haves so that we understand the disparity, uh, but typically, you know, we're seeing the people on the low side of society. And because there is such a great concentration of wealth, uh, there's a lot of criminality. And a lot of our characters are criminals. But, you know, as, as Hollywood likes to do, and as uh, writers of, like, uh, true crime fiction like to do, and, you know, noir-type detective fiction, and also, like, glamorized Miami Vice-type stuff, uh, criminals are portrayed as really cool, you know? Uh, and I would say, for the most part, criminals aren't that cool. You know, they tend to have more that money than the people around them, so they tend to flaunt it, which means they tend to be rather gauche because, you know, they haven't grown up with money. They're not of a class of people who are used to having money. This isn't all, you know, in the service of are we in a cyberpunk future, though. Um, the, the AIs like to say that cyber, cyberpunk is about body modification and transhumanism, it's about great disparities between wealth and poor. They always say it's about surveillance. And when I just scan my brain looking for, you know, examples of cyberpunk classics, which really focus on ubiquitous surveillance, I don't come up with much. Uh, and if you ask, you know, what are the, you know, the classics of like the definitive works of cyberpunk fiction, invariably everybody, human and AI, says, um, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, but they tend not to mention that it's an adaptation of a novel by Philip K. Dick, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which has the same setting and some of the same themes, but Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is kind of comedic, and it's got a whole level, level of satire to it that is not present in the movie, and uh, it just has a different tone, generally. And, and the androids are not called replicants, they're just called androids in the book are in no way sympathetic characters. They're just venal, evil, you know, just jerks. <laughs> uh, with no redeeming qualities. So it's, it's, I'd say it's fair. Like, you could reasonably include Blade Runner as a classic or definitive work of, of cyberpunk fiction and make no mention of Drew Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, even though the setting the technology, the plot, and some of the themes are the same, but the tone is totally different. And cyberpunk tends to take itself pretty seriously. It doesn't, doesn't go in for a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of humor at its own expense. But mostly, I would say, cyberpunk is urban fiction. It is about living life in cities. And, you know, the other classics of uh, cyberpunk beyond, like, on the screen, it's Blade Runner, it's Akira, it's Ghost in the Shell, um, and then, you know, in terms of games, it's like Metal Gear Solid, and more recently, Cyberpunk 2077. And I haven't played either of those two games, but I've been watching videos about, you know, their settings and their plot and whatnot to get a little bit of familiarity. Uh, the Cyberpunk game that I think of, you know, that I did play extensively was one called Oni, which borrowed liberally 
from Ghost in the Shell in terms of its setting and its main character. But the studio that made Oni, Bungie, their next, uh, their next game was Halo. And they never went back to Oni to revisit it, to update it. Um, you know, Halo was their bread and butter thereafter. But, um, you know, here I sit with advanced technology in my hand. I'm talking to you through it. Uh, and I will use it not only as, you know, a camcorder, which is definitely an out-of-date term, uh, but also as a video editing station and as a computer, you know, to add graphics and then to, you know, as an interface with YouTube. I mean, this is a very powerful piece of technology that I'm using. Uh, but here I sit, you know, unemployed, and while I am self-employed, I am under self-employed, <laughs> underemployed in my self-employment, uh, which is my own just, you know, inertia. Uh, but, you know, I'm living a low life, not a criminal life, uh, because my needs, my basic needs are met, you know, my material needs are met, my social ambitions are stymied, but my, you know, I've got food, I don't have to do anything, I don't have to sacrifice my dignity or endanger my body in order to secure food, shelter, clothing, uh, don't have access to affordable medical care, but I don't take a lot of chances and I'm in decent health, so, you know. 10 years to go before I qualify for Medicare. But, you know, from a certain perspective, I'm, I'm living in the cyberpunk future, but I'm in a rural setting. And cyberpunk, as much it is, as it is about its themes, is also a visual aesthetic. And that visual aesthetic is big city at night with lots of neon and beautiful, you know, skyscrapers that are lit up and, you know, that light up the night. And they're just these like dreamy landscapes from a distance but you know if you're at street level it's it's dirty it's dangerous it's squalid it's corrupt it's gross you know up close it's gross at street level um, the higher you go in the cyberpunk city the more luxurious things get the more rarefied and privileged you know the environments uh, but again we tend not to see a lot of that we tend to be stuck in the the point of view of characters that are on the down and the out, which is kind of the detective noir um, element, you know, the precursor element that a lot of cyberpunk was spun out from. But there is the screen, there is also the page, and on the page, uncontested. I mean, anybody, any, you know, any definition of cyberpunk is going to start with William Gibson and most notably Neuromancer. Uh, what, what year did that come out? Like 84, I think, something like that. Uh, I was definitely a teenager, I was in high school, and I don't think I read it until I was like in uh, junior college, you know, community college. But uh, I definitely did read it in the 80s, and I, you know, was tuned in to the, the cyberpunk vibe from the get-go. What, what always blows me away is that Akira, you know, which visually is just, it's one of the defining works of cyberpunk, the movie was released in 1988, and the manga had been, you know, in production for a while before that. I graduated high school in 1986. I'm 55 now. That thing is old. And yet it was far looking and I don't want to say super deep in terms of its themes, but really astounding in terms of its visual detail. And yeah, I mean, it's got some, some trippy head, you know, head case kind of musings at the end, you know, the, the college dorm bong rip late night philosophical discussions, you know, sophomoric discussions though. Um, definitely there's elements of that in Akira, but really the thing that defines it is its grittiness, its visceral violence, and just the astounding detail that goes into the creation of the setting and, uh, you know, the, the blocking of the scenes and the, you know, there are, there are scenes and shots in Akira which are just iconic, which have been replicated over and over and over again, like, a, like Canada's slide on the bike. Anyway, cyberpunk is about body modification. Well, we don't have BCIs, brain-computer interfaces, that are beyond, you know, the very, very basics. Uh, it, it just doesn't exist yet. So the, the technology is not available to anybody, much less the poor. You know, one of the things about cyberpunk is that stuff which seems futuristic in science fiction is depicted as, you know, within the grasp of the poor. People who can't afford rent can afford a prosthetic arm. 
you know, because the technology is just that ubiquitous and cheap and commonplace and whatnot. And we're definitely not there. Definitely not there. Um, and so, you know, from my perspective, that's a good thing. I mean, sure, I want the digital immortality. And if you're paralyzed, I want you to be able to use your limbs and walk. And, you know, I, I certainly, I, I wouldn't reject the technology when it came along, but it's also going to make possible full dive VR. And if your life sucks and you can live any life you want in utterly convincing detail, you know, in simulation, lots of people are going to disappear up their own assholes, never to be seen again, you know. And um, if people have already demonstrated that they're anxious to modify their bodies, and they do it in the stupidest ways, you know, like implanting blinky LEDs under their skin, or some guy in Australia, he, he put his Metro card under his skin, you know, like the chip from his Metro card. How stupid is that? I mean, you're so anxious for body modification that you're going to do dumb stuff, or like cut your tongue in half, or whatever. So as soon as... Um, you know, neural interfaces are available where your brain can communicate as flawlessly with a prosthetic limb as it does with your natural limbs, people are going to just do the stupidest stuff. But anyway, it, it'll also do a lot of good. So yeah, I'm, I'm anxious for that BCI technology to make its appearance, but oh man, as, as a culture, we don't have the self-discipline yet. We don't have the good taste, really to avoid the, the ugly, gross excesses that will come with that. But the fact that we don't have that BCI technology, that brain-computer interface technology now, means that a big, big chunk of the cyberpunk genre is, is just not present in our lives. So in that respect, we're not living in a cyberpunk future. More and more of us do live in cities. And I think the migration to cities will continue. And lots of people who get to cities, you know, they're envisioning the, the tile towers and the bright lights and the glamour and the fame and the opportunity to do exciting stuff. And a lot of people just end up working long hours at shitty jobs to afford rent in tiny, just, you know, shabby little accommodations. Um, that aspect of the, the cyberpunk genre is definitely present in the world. Although, again, here I am sitting in Berryville, Arkansas. I'm not experiencing it. <clears throat> Another element of, of cyberpunk is, you know, it's... it's a quintessentially, I think William Gibson's Canadian, but as I've said before in these videos, I consider Canada to be part of America. You know, it's, it's, we're, the two countries together are North America. Our cultures are almost indistinguishable from one another, we, except for the Quebecois folk. We uh, speak the same language with almost identical accents. I mean, there's a bunch of different regional accents in the United States alone, but you know, you can tell an American when you hear one, unless they're Canadian, <laughs> you know? I mean, they'll sound like an American, and, and unless you're listening for the aboot, and uh, what else do they say differently? Not much. <laughs> Oot and aboot. That's about it. Do they say schedule instead of schedule? Um, it's really hard to spot a Canadian, really, you know, unless they're from Quebec. All that to say, I think maybe William Gibson is Canadian, but cyberpunk is... It is heavily, heavily inflected with Japanese imagery and references to Japan. And in fact, uh, when we first meet Case, the point of view character, a uh, protagonist, I guess you could say, of Neuromancer, he is hanging out in a shabby neighborhood in, um, in Tokyo, you know, in Japan. Uh, but as I was thinking back on Ghost in the Shell, which is another manga turned anime movie which it's been adapted so many times to the screen by so many different people with different visions different locations different themes but the one that everybody thinks about i think is the first one from uh, 1995 by uh, mamoru oshi and there was a sequel to that called innocence and you know it's very cyberpunk in the you know the higher up you get in the city uh, the more rarefied it gets the more privileged people are and then on the street things are pretty dirty and shabby and, and hard scrabble uh, but whereas american 
cyberpunk fiction and fiction generally and just the American attitude is distrustful of government and suspicious of undue concentrations of power, particularly in corporations. The Japanese have a very different relationship to authority. And I was thinking back to Ghost in the Shell and in the film and the manga, the original manga is very different in tone from the film. It's a lot like, you know, the difference between Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep and Blade Runner. The manga is, one, it's very sexual. I mean, uh, Motoko Kusanagi, the main character, is drawn to please the male gaze, you know, and I got no problem with that, but uh, it's, it's undeniable, you know, it's definitely titillating. Uh, in a way that, you know, even when they show the character naked in the movie, it's not very erotic. It's, it's stiff. You know, it's more robotic. Um, but the manga is comedic. It is, definitely has a sense of humor, and it definitely has a self-referential sort of uh, willingness to poke fun at itself. But thinking back to the movie and thinking about the topic of ubiquitous surveillance, there's lots of surveillance going on. Uh, there, there is lots of, the, you know, the, the police with their cyber brains, they have access to the records of other people's activity with their cyber brains, you know, not just what they're seeing through their phones, not where, just where they're moving to or, you know, who they're communicating with, but what they're actually experiencing. You know, the government has access to that. But in Ghost in the Shell, you know, the operatives of Section 9, uh, Major Kusanagi and Bato and uh, Togusa and, you know, the whole crew, they never abuse that power. They never use it for personal gain. They never invade anybody's privacy, you know, gratuitously. They always do it. They, they have access to all of this surveillance technology and all the information that it produces, but they only ever use it to fight crime and thwart terrorists, which I think is, you know, it is indicative of that different Japanese sensibility toward authority. You know, the Japanese just, they don't get as bent out of shape about the government exercising power over people or corporations exercising power, you know, or accumulating grand, great wealth and whatnot. But then I went to revisit Akira. And Akira is the exact opposite of, you know, Ghost in the Shell in terms of how it changed tone and look and everything, you know, when moving from page to screen. Otomo Katsuhiro, who is the original author and illustrator of the manga, is also the director and the writer of the film. So stylistically, it is identical. The, the tone, the themes, it is just utterly congruent. The, the two medium, or media, <laughs> the two mediums, media, uh, are utterly congruent, you know, under, under Otomo Katsuhiro, or Katsuhiro Otomo, depending on... <laughs> Otomo is the family name. They say that first in Japan. And I was just remembering that that film starts out you know, in, in a place called Neo-Tokyo, which is the rebuilt Tokyo, in, in the chronology of Akira, um, there is this psychic event that destroys old Tokyo and which, you know, from, from afar looks like a nuclear blast, but it wasn't. But it sets off World War III. And Neo-Tokyo is built in place of the old destroyed Tokyo. Uh, and the old Tokyo was destroyed, I think, in 1988. And this, you know, futuristic cyberpunk vision of Akira takes place in 2019, uh, the same year that the original Blade Runner takes place in, which, of course, is, you know, the past to us, a future that never came to be. Uh, but in the beginning, I guess just a bit of personal experience with, uh, with the movie Akira. I was familiar with it. I knew that it existed, and maybe I'd seen a few clips of it. But it was something that when it first started to enter into American consciousness, it was because people were passing around bootleg VHS tapes uh, in Japanese. And it played with subtitles like in art house theaters, but I never saw it there. And when I first got to Japan, I think in 1991 or 92, uh, I picked up a used VHS copy of the film in Japanese. And I was studying Japanese, but I didn't, I didn't speak it and still don't speak it nearly well enough to follow a film like Akira. But I saw it repeatedly in Japanese. And then I started to read the, uh, the manga um, that Marvel published. You know, they flipped the pages around, they colorized it, they changed it to, you know, changed the text to English. So after I'd seen the film many times, I started to read the manga and to pick up the story and the details of the story, um, you know, from that, 
which was a weird way to take in a film. And then many years later, I started to watch an English dub of it, and it was awful. I couldn't stand it. I just to this day, I've never seen an English dub version of Akira. I just can't. I can't take it. Uh, you know, the dubbing. I don't want to blame the actors. It's just Japanese as a language is structured differently from English, and you just can't like, particularly if you're trying to make the the lips match the sounds. You're going to change the text, you're going to change the meaning, you're going to change the feel, and it just it doesn't feel right. But the film starts out like in Tokyo or Neo Tokyo, which is, this, like all cyberpunk cities, full of tall buildings, full of neon, it's glowing, it's beautiful at a distance, but when you get up close, it's grubby and ugly. And there are protests going on against the government, and the government is squashing the protests with an unnecessarily heavy hand, like with militarized riot police, the streets are full of tear gas, um, people are, you know, turning over cars and setting them on fire, and at the same time, you know, there's people, you know, dressed up nice, trying to eat fine dinners, you know, on in nice restaurants, but at street level, and, um, but you've also got, like, these two motorcycle gangs that are fighting each other in the streets, on motorcycles, in a deadly fashion. I mean, it's brutally violent. And they're doing it for no good reason that you can tell. They just have this ongoing rivalry where they, you know, they meet up uh, in certain locations and they fight. And so, you know, while there is, presumably the people who are protesting have some reason to protest, when I saw the film in Japanese repeatedly, to me, the reason for the protest wasn't really important. What it just said was, this city, which is gleaming and luxurious and prosperous, is also a powder keg of tension. And there is this need for a release of, you know, violent activity, be it fighting with the cops or fighting, you know, between rival gangs. And I guess that brings me, you know, to us now here. Again, I'm in a small town that that tension doesn't seem to be here, but, you know, I can go to YouTube and watch just endless footage of people in cities behaving in needlessly violent ways, you know, getting into fights, some of them ideological, some of them egoic, you know, many ideological fights are also egoic fights, but some have no ideological component at all. It's just, hey, you looked at me wrong, you looked at my girl, I don't like you, you know, violence. And then there's you know, in, in the blue cities, <laughs> don't need to name them, uh, where somebody has decided that we're just not going to enforce the law in terms of, you know, crimes committed at street level, which is to say shopping or shoplifting, which has turned into organized, you know, theft, uh, gang theft, like just mobs of people come in masked. And of course, you know, the pandemic has, uh, has normalized mask wearing in public. Um, particularly in those same cities. And, you know, people will steal $100,000 worth of clothes from a fancy store in a couple of minutes to the point where, you know, big retailers are pulling out of certain areas where the law is not enforced. But again, I say it's not enforced at street level. You know, the privileges of the wealthy, the peace of the environments of the wealthy will be maintained, mostly. But like in Seattle, I know I, yeah, when I lived in Seattle, I lived in downtown Seattle. I lived right like, like one block away from uh, Westlake Center, which is this upscale shopping center. I was just a couple blocks from the Pike Place Market. You know, these are tourist areas. And now, you know, I see video on YouTube of these same areas, which used to be these, you know, these, these sort of rarefied places. Like you would go there and hang out because it's just a really pleasant place to be. And now it's just a sea of tents and panhandlers and junkies. And, you know, there were plenty of panhandlers and junkies in the 90s in Seattle when I lived there, but not like it, not like now, you know, at least according to the videos that I'm seeing on YouTube. And I don't think that these are like, there are phases where, you know, some days there's a sea of tents in Westlake Center and some days it's nice. <laughs> anyway, uh, that sort of bespeaks of a cyberpunk future. But I, you know, a question arises, um, how much of the dystopian aspects of cyberpunk, the genre, you know, the fictional genre, come from bad policies? And how much is just, you know, humanity straining against the limits of how many people you can, you know, squish together in a confined space? Uh, how much we will tolerate in terms of the disparity of wealth and opportunity? Um, you know, how much of the dystopic aspect of cyberpunk genre 
is an effect of just the physical limitations of what a high-tech society can be and how much is a result of bad policy. And, you know, typically these stories, largely because they are told from, you know, street level and from the perspective of the have-nots, they don't focus on government policy. They don't focus on civic policy. Those characters are not interested in that. It doesn't enter into their their dialogue. It doesn't enter, enter, doesn't enter into their collective interests, you know. Um, so who's to say? And, you know, when people speculate, like, if somebody ever asks me, you know, what will the future be like? I say, what is the present like? It's very different depending on where you are, who you are, who you're related to, who you know, how much money you have, who you work for, who works for you. Um, you know, it, it is a dystopic hell for some people, and it is the best of all possible worlds for others. And the future will be like that as well. Just more so. You know, even better for the best, even even worse for those with the least. But maybe not. You know, the, the hope, the dream, is that things will continue to get better, that a rising tide raises all boats, and that the people at the very, very bottom, uh, their standard of living and their quality of life will slowly increase to the point where it wouldn't be a nightmare, you know, to trade places with anybody in the society, even if it is marked by intense disparity of wealth you know, in lifestyle. Anyway, I've been thinking about this with the intention of writing it down, but I just don't write that much. Although I did, I did write a blog post a couple days ago about the uh, premiere episode of the Ahsoka series on Disney+. Plus. So if you have any interest in that, which is definitely, it actually has some cyberpunk elements to it, but, you know, Star Wars is basically space fantasy, space opera, uh, you know, with wizards and knights and monsters, you know, fighting with swords swords just glow and hum. But if you have any interest in uh, that, check out my Substack, and I will put a link in the video description. All right, I believe that is all the jabbering I will do for now, 26 minutes worth. <laughs> Catch you later.